Hello and welcome back to CS420, a course on game hacking. This section is going to be on the basics of the operating system and memory scanning, which is arguably the most important skill in game hacking. We're not going to go deep into operating systems since that can be an entire course on its own. We're just going to learn the parts that are relevant to game hacking and then we'll move on. Memory scanning is a technique used to find things like health and gold in a video game. We'll go over how that works and I'll demonstrate a few live examples at the end. Let's briefly dive into what we need to know about operating systems. The operating system does quite a few things, but these two are the most important. First, it manages the hardware in your computer. And this part really isn't that important to game hackers, so we won't touch on this very much. The second thing it does is that it manages the programs running on your computer. When you double click an exe file, when you open an application, it's the operating system that is responsible for making sure that program runs. And let's look at how that works. So here we have the executable file for Squally on the left, and that's a file that exists on your hard drive. And when you double click that exe file, the operating system basically takes that file and copies it into RAM. A couple other things happen behind the scenes, but again, it's one of those things where you don't need to know all the details. Now, if you want to know just for the sake of knowing, you can read up on loaders and executable file formats, and I'll put links to the relevant Wikipedia articles in the description. It's worth mentioning that when we hack the game, we hack the copy in RAM, not on disk. This means none of the changes we make are permanent. If we break something or crash the game, it doesn't matter, we can just run the game again. This is the main difference between software cracking and game hacking. When cracking software, you generally hack the version on disk rather than the version in RAM. This is because in software cracking, the goal is to make a paid program free by removing serial key checks and that sort of thing. In game hacking, you would still want to be able to play the game normally when you want to. For this reason, we only hack the version in RAM. So let's cover some of the tools that game hackers use. Cheat Engine is the most well-known tool. It's been around since about 2003. It's well tested and it gets the job done. The other tool listed here is Squalor. This is the tool that I've been working on. It's faster than Cheat Engine, but it's newer and has some issues. If you're watching this video in 2019, probably just stick with Cheat Engine. However, if you're watching this video in the future, check out Squalor. I'll put links to both in the description. One thing to note is that when you're installing Cheat Engine, they have optional promoted software that they bundle with the installer. You have to make sure to decline those during the installation process. So don't just spam the next button, just be careful about that. So next let's talk a bit about how these tools work. All right, so because the operating system has so much power over running programs, we can abuse the operating system to help us cheat in games. You can say, hey, operating system, you see that game running over there? Go ahead and change health to 100 for me. And as long as you tell it exactly where to look, it'll follow your orders. Every operating system has a bunch of things you can ask it to do. These functionalities are known as an API or a library. I used to find these terms confusing, but they really just mean code that somebody else wrote that I can use. The operating system is code. It's written in C and C++. We're able to use some of that code when we develop our hacking tools. On Windows, this is known as the Windows API, and on Mac and Linux, they have their own API. Some of these are really powerful. Some of these functions that they let us use are very powerful and allow us to cheat in games. One example is this write process memory function here on the screen. It's used to edit things running in RAM, which is exactly what we need to cheat in our games. You could just fire up a C++ or C Sharp program and use this code to edit the program. This is how both Cheat Engine and Squalor work. I'm going to leave it at that for now. Later I'll have a lecture on how you would actually implement a memory editor using the Windows API, and I'll go into much more detail there. If you recall from before, I mentioned that hacking can be broken up into three steps. Find the thing, exploit the thing, and observe the results. For this hacking method, memory scanning is the act of finding the number you want to change. It's like hitting Control F in your browser to search for something. In our case, we want to use it to find health, mana, gold, skill points, the XYZ coordinates of the player, anything numeric. Once you find the number you want to change, you can edit it with memory editing, and then you just see if it worked, and you're done. Before I get into this, we need to update our understanding of what a computer program actually is. So 
Last lecture, I said we could think of a program as a bunch of zeros and ones, and I also mentioned that this was a very bad understanding. I promised that we would keep building on this, so let's build on it. So if this was the memory of a game loaded into RAM, then somewhere in this sea of zeros and ones would be the player's health. Now let's say we somehow figured out that this particular sequence of zeros and ones somehow represent the player's health. One might think that in order to increase the player's health, we could just delete the old bits and put in a bunch of ones. Now this is wrong. This is not how it works. Look how laggy this is. I released the one key a long time ago and it's still trying to catch up. The problem is that when you insert a new digit, it has to shift over potentially billions of other digits. And this is super slow. Let's explore how we actually accomplish our goal. To make things less confusing, computer scientists a long time ago agreed to group bits into eight. This grouping of eight bits is known as a byte. This is a lot cleaner to look at and a lot cleaner to work with. This restriction is baked into almost everything in your computer. Files have to be a multiple of eight bits. It's impossible to have a file that only takes up seven bits. It would have to be rounded up to eight. If I have a text file that just has one letter in it, its size on the disk is one byte. So now let's say we found the player's health. Let's say it's this byte here. If we wanted to change it, we would simply overwrite the existing value. Now I know we haven't learned binary yet. Next lecture we'll dive into how binary actually works, but for now just bear with me. It's important to note that because we can't insert new data, that means whoever programmed the game had to decide the limit in advance. It turns out the maximum for one byte of data is 255. If you took this and converted it to decimal, it would be 255. And that works pretty well for health because a lot of games will have like 100 max health, so you never have to go worry about going over the memory limit. However, if you have gold in a video game, this one byte is not enough, so you would actually have to use multiple bytes. A lot of games will use four. When you have four bytes, the limit's about two billion. So programmers will take this, group it into four, and say this is actually one number. Sometimes they'll use groupings of one, two, four, or even eight. If I'm highlighting the right amount here, yeah. So this is our new updated mental model of what a computer program is. It's still not perfect, but this is far less insulting than our original model. We know that a computer program is made up of a bunch of bytes, which are groups of eight bits. And to represent larger numbers, a programmer can group bytes together to give themselves more digits to work with. These can be groups of one, two, four, and eight, which we'll learn the reasons for in a later lecture. And I glossed over this, but you may have been able to figure out that binary numbers can be converted to decimal numbers. We can convert the highlighted group of four bytes in the bottom left into the number 623. Luckily for us, most tools will handle this sort of thing for us, so we'd never have to really look at binary. Now on to memory scanning. I mentioned earlier that memory scanning is like hitting Control F in your browser, except instead of searching for text on a page, we're searching for numbers and memory. So if a player has 100 health, we'll assume that we're searching for a number that can be up to four bytes long, because like I said, that's what most programmers choose. And there's a problem with this though. And allow me to demonstrate what the issue is. It's not as easy as just hitting Control F. So let's say that it did work exactly like Control F does in your browser. And we want to search for 100 because that's how much health we have. Well, we quickly run into the problem of there's just too many matches. It turns out that most games take up anywhere from one gigabyte to eight gigabytes of memory for larger games. And this can be about four billion numbers, which means we'll get a lot of matches. So we need to figure out how to narrow down our search. And there's a cool magic trick that makes that possible. But before we can learn about that, we need to know what an address is. First, let's go back to our mental model of what a computer program is. There are these groups of eight bits, these bytes, that start at the top left and go from left to right until they reach the end. Well, we can call that first group of bits, that first byte, address zero, because it exists at the first location. It's kind of weird, but programmers tend to start list with zero instead of one. So the first one is zero, then it goes to one, then two. Now, if we keep going, this first group of four bytes starts at address 116. 
Now, even though it occupies four addresses, we refer to it by the first address in the sequence. Uh, just to you know, give an analogy, right? Just because you have a mansion, just because you have a lot of property, you still only have one street address. And the same is kind of true here. Now, it's important to note this example here in the center. See, at address 169 is where we have the value 100. And this can get very confusing for people, right? You don't want to confuse addresses and values. The value is whatever the bits inside represent, and the address is just the location, right? I want to reiterate this. So here, the value is just 100 if we look at this box, but it exists at, a, at position 169. Value 100, position 169. And the value can change, but the address can never change. This will always be 169, but 100 can change if the bits change. Right, if I kept flipping the first bit, this value would change to 101. So I'll go ahead and flip, flip between these two. 100, bit changes, 101. Right, but the address will always be 169. So now that we know a little bit about addresses, we can actually learn how to solve that problem from earlier. That problem of, we have too many matches. So the best way for me to do this is just to jump into some live examples and we'll solve this together. So here we have an early build of Squally open on the left, and we have Cheat Engine open on the right. The first thing we're going to want to do is tell Cheat Engine which game we're trying to hack. And we do that with this little glowing select a process button, the computer icon here. We pick Squally, and now Cheat Engine knows what we're trying to do. Now, our goal is to hack our health. You see here we have 11 health, and we want to change that to heal ourselves up. So what we do in Cheat Engine is we can search for 11. Now there's a lot of overwhelming looking settings here, but we can ignore most of them. Just know that we're using four bytes. I mentioned earlier that that's how most programmers store integers. And we hit the first scan button. Now we got a lot of matches, right? We have about 16,000 matches, which is a considerable amount. So there's no way we're just gonna be able to flip through these and you know, eyeball which one of these is health. Uh, we can ignore this column for now. So just know there's address, which we covered earlier, and value. Address here is being represented as a hex number, but it's still the same exact concept. So how do we narrow this list down? Well, since we already know everything that's 11, we can actually just go ahead and take some damage in the game. So I'm gonna get hit again. And now we want to know which things used to be 11, but are 8 now. And that's how scanning works. So I go ahead and type 8, and it'll search this list, right? So now we're searching, our, we're searching on our search, essentially, right? Just narrowing the search down. So if I hit this, there's only one result. We found it. That was super easy. It only took two scans. Sometimes it can take a lot more, but for us, we got pretty lucky. Now I just double-click this value, change it to 16, and in the game, I have 16 health. That easy. Now let's jump into another example using Squalor, my software. So here there's a drop down. Just go ahead and hit this and pick Squally from the list, similar to Cheat Engine. And up in this top bar, all the settings are good too. It's already set to a four byte integer. And we can go ahead and just type in 380, because now we're going to try and change our gold in our minigame Hexus. So I go ahead and start this scan. I get a fair number of matches. There's not a lot, only 132 matches this time. And what I can go ahead and do is buy something in the game. So I'll go ahead and buy this card. And now it's 275. So I just go in and now I try and narrow the search by searching for 275. There's only one match. So I go ahead and double click this. And now we change it to something else. So I can change it to 200,000. Now, you may have noticed that in the game it hasn't updated. Well, it turns out that it doesn't update immediately every single time. Sometimes you have to do something to refresh the screen. So if I go ahead and buy another card, now it recognized, okay, I increased my gold. Now it updates. And that's all there is to it. So in our examples, we learned how to find health and we learned how to find money. This is enough to get you started, but there's still a lot more we need to cover. For example, what if you wanted to find the X and Y coordinates of the player to write a teleportation hack? 
How would you do it? We have no idea what the player's X coordinate is. It could be a hundred, a thousand, a million. No idea. Also, the cheats we learned how to create aren't reusable. If we restart the game, the addresses we found for gold and health are no longer valid. And we'll learn the reasons for that later. But what we learned today is enough to be dangerous, right? I encourage you to go start hacking some single player games, the, whatever you own, and get familiar with the process. Okay, thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or feedback, uh, leave a comment below. Thank you.